Rated X. Welcome to the Launchpad Podcast. Right you are, motherfucker! I'm Zach Long, and welcome to The Launchpad. Today on this album review podcast, we are going to be talking about Robert Johnson and the complete recording sessions. Now, Robert Johnson has been widely known as a more mysterious character in music because a lot of his backstory is highly debated. There's a lot of missing information. I'm just sorting out some of the most commonly accepted details to give you a little background about him. And then we're just going to touch on a few notes about the album itself, some things that stuck out to me, and uh, we'll take it from there. Robert Johnson was born in Mississippi, possibly on May 8th, 1911, to Julia and Noah Johnson. Robert spent his childhood growing up in Memphis without knowing his biological father, and it was in Memphis that he acquired his love for and knowledge of the blues. Once Julia informed Robert about his biological father, Robert adopted the surname Johnson, using it on the certificate of his marriage to a 16-year-old Virginia Travis in 1929. Virginia died in childbirth shortly after the marriage, and Robert Johnson made his way to Arkansas. Around this time, the blues musician Sun House moved to Robbinsville, Arkansas. House remembered Johnson as a little boy who was a competent harmonica player, but an embarrassingly bad guitarist. Soon after, Johnson left Robinsonville for the area around Martinsville, close to his birthplace. And a lot of people suspect around this time he began searching for his natural father. It was here that he perfected the guitar style of House and learned other styles from Ike Zimmerman. Johnson and Ike Zimmerman would practice in a graveyard at night because it was quiet and no one would disturb them. Zimmerman was rumored by the locals to have learned supernaturally to play guitar by visiting graveyards at midnight, which may have inspired the legend of Robert selling his soul to the devil to get his guitar skills. But according to that legend, a young Johnson had a tremendous desire to become a great blues musician. Johnson took his guitar to a crossroad near Dockery Plantation at midnight. There he was met by the devil, who took the guitar and tuned it. The devil played a few songs and then returned the guitar to Johnson, giving him mastery of the instrument. In exchange for his soul, Johnson was able to create the blues for which he became famous. Surviving relatives of Johnson's wife told the blues researcher Mac McCormick that his wife's death was a divine punishment for Robert's decision to sing secular songs, known back then as selling your soul to the devil. Johnson himself accepted the phrase as a description of his resolve to abandon the settled life of a husband and farmer to become a full-time blues musician. So when Johnson next appeared in Robinsonville, he seemed to have miraculously acquired a guitar technique which further propelled the myth. Sun House was interviewed at the time when the legend of Johnson's pact with the devil was well known, and he was asked whether he attributed Johnson's technique to this pact, and his answers have been taken as confirmation. Musicians who knew Johnson testified that he was a nice guy and fairly average, except of course for his musical talent, his weakness for whiskey and women, and his commitment to the road. When Johnson arrived in town, he would play for tips on street corners or in front of the local barbershop or restaurants. Musical associates have said that in live performances, Johnson often did not focus on his dark and complex original composition, but instead pleased audiences by performing more well-known pop songs of the day. Johnson had also developed an uncanny ability to establish a rapport with his audience. In every town in which he stopped, he would establish ties to the local community that would serve him well when he passed through again a month or a year later. In the last year of his life, Johnson traveled to St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, and New York City playing gigs. Johnson died on August 16, 1938 at the age of 27 in Mississippi of unconfirmed causes. His death was not reported publicly. He merely disappeared from the historical record, and it was not until almost 30 years later when Gail Wardlow, a Mississippi-based musicologist, was researching Johnson's life 
and found his death certificate. The death certificate, which only listed the date and location with no official cause of death. No formal autopsy was ever done. This has also led to tales of legend, just like the other missing pieces of Johnson's history. According to the blues musician Sonny Boy Williamson, Johnson had been flirting with a married woman at a dance, and she gave him a bottle of whiskey that was poisoned by her husband. Before Johnson could take a drink of the bottle, Williamson knocked it out of his hand, urging him to never drink from a bottle that he had not personally opened. Johnson replied, don't you ever knock a bottle out of my hand again. Soon after, he was offered another poison bottle and accepted it. Johnson is reported to have begun feeling ill in the evening after and had to be helped back to his room in the early hours. After the next three days, his condition steadily worsened. Witnesses reported that he died in a convulsive state of severe pain. The exact location of Johnson's grave is officially unknown. Three different markers have been erected around possible sites in church cemeteries outside of Greenwood. The complete recordings album was made with the help of H.C. Spire. He helped Johnson record 29 songs for the American Record Company. The album, The Complete Recordings, contains all 29 songs, while Robert Johnson's professional recording career can be measured in merely months. His musical legacy has survived more than 70 years, and his influence continues to span many, many genres even to this day. In 2012, the album was ranked number 22 on Rolling Stone magazine's list of all-time 500 greatest albums. The album for me, um, a few songs that stuck out were When You Got a Good Friend. To me, this song just sounds like a showcase of quintessential blues. The strumming guitar pops with rhythm, and it really gives you that old-school 30s blues feel. Another track that really stuck out was Ramblin' On My Mind. The song just has a sound that makes me feel the vibe of the 30s. It really just makes me think that I'm back in Memphis or, you know, some of the places he was playing. And I can only imagine, you know, what it was like to see him live back in the day playing songs like this that up until this point nobody was doing, really. I mean, there were people out there definitely making blues, but in terms of the way he was doing it, the technical style he was using, you know, he was totally a pioneer, and I can only imagine what it was like seeing him back in the day. Another track that stuck out to me was the Preaching Blues. There's some ferocious guitar picking and sliding technique on the track, and it was a song that I think it's only like two and two and a half minutes, but I wish it was longer. It's one of those songs where it's so good that you wish it was just a little longer than it ended up being. There's also a track called The Drunken Hearted Man. Yeah, the song had a really sad vibe that almost takes me back into the headspace of like a Jack Kerouac era of hitchhiking the U.S. by day while partying at jazz clubs by night. And it's a song that out of most of these tracks, I mean, there's a ton of songs on this album, but that was one of the ones where like the whole combination of the music, the lyrics, the tone of his voice, the cadence of his voice, it really just was a complete song. You know, it just made me feel like, without a doubt, like every element of this is top notch. And then lastly, my favorite song off the album was Love in Vain. You know, this track, one of the reasons my favorites is, I think lyrically, it seems to be the most open song on the album. It seems to really tell a personal story. And all the songs, when I listened to them, I read the lyrics. And I think this one, while it is you know, not overly complicated, it does have simplicity. It's very, very effective in... Just from the way he sings, once again, I think it really conveys a personal tone, personal message. To give this album a rating, admittedly, I'm not like a huge blues fan. I respect the blues, but it definitely is not my favorite genre. I don't listen to a ton of blues. However, I feel this album really shines and shows the cream of the crop of what old school blues can offer. It's really a shame that Robert Johnson died so young. And if this album is any indication, he would have blessed us with many more raw blues songs to feed our dark side. So overall, I'm going to say this one's about an eight, eight and a half out of 10 for me. And it's something that if you're curious about the blues or like old school music or the legend of Robert Johnson, it's definitely worth a look.